Good morning, everyone. I'm Ray. Uh, I'm very happy to come to Spark Summit to talk about Tangram, the unified batch scheduler we built in Facebook to support all the Spark workloads and other batch workloads in Facebook. So this is my colleague, Hao. And uh, we are from the same team, Data Warehouse team. Before I joined Data Warehouse team, I worked in Facebook's uh, social graph store team, and I built the uh, social graph indexing. And uh, Hao is a research scientist. He joined us, and his focus right now is on the uh, resource manager and the scheduling side. So this is our today's agenda. First of all, I will be talking about the overview of Tangram and the intent of us of building our own scheduler instead of picking the open source one. And I will go a little bit deeper to talk about the Tangram architecture and all the component, main components of Tangram. Then how we will be talk about the, our scheduling policies and the resource alloc allocations in detail. Then I will be talking about a little bit about our future work. So first of all, what is Tangram? So Tangram is a unified batch scheduling system in Facebook. We use that system to reliably run various batch workloads. And uh, uh, we use efficient heterogeneous resource management to realize our goal. So by heterogeneous here, I want to highlight that within our cluster, the machines are heterogeneous. They have different hardware configuration and we call it, we, we tag them with different machine type. And uh, they also are coming from different physical location. And uh, at the same time, the job itself is also heterogeneous. For instance, within one job, we can express the scheduling constraint through label expression. Then we can, the scheduler can know, okay, your job needs machine uh, which has type one, or the machine which is type six. Or you need a GPU machine, the GPU model is something. And uh, lastly, our scheduling system are operating at a very big scale. So I will talk about the scale in the next slides. So first of all, let's take a closer look to see what are the workloads we are running on top of Tangram. So there are four main workloads. The first one, we call it a single job. Basically, it means when we run this job, we only need resource from one box. Usually, this job means like Spark driver, or we use single job instance to do machine learning, or offline or online training. And the second category is batch job. So it's like we run a Spark query, and uh, they need uh, multiple resources from multiple hosts. And uh, the third one is the interesting one. We call it a GAN job. So basically, we use GAN job to run our distributed graph processing system. Uh, we call it a giraffe. And uh, the other big use case for GAN job is to run our distributed training system. So from the scheduling perspective, GAN job is more rigid compared with the other two jobs because in terms of resource allocation, the GAN job follows the all or nothing semantics. It means either you get all the resources you can run, otherwise you need to wait. And the last one is the long running job. They run continuously and right now we host online training jobs in Tangram. And of course, uh, they can be one-off job and also recurring job. So um, you may ask me why we pick Tang why, why, why we build Tangram instead of pick a new uh, any open source one. First of all, we can say actually we need to support various workload within our uh, system, and in terms of workload, they vary in terms of like resource requirement, scheduling constraints, duration and all kinds of stuff. And the second reason is we have a very high demand of having like a highly customized scheduling policy. There are a bunch of 
examples. One example is in order to make our ad hoc users very happy to use our system, we build our own like top end user scheduling policy, which favor both fairness and then the user can also make progress. And in order to support our high demand of machine learning workloads, we build our, our own multidimensional demand control policy. It means we can control based on model, team, user, even the other things very flexibly to cap the resource allocation. And the third thing is we also need to integrate with a lot of Facebook internal services. Because you know Facebook data is at a very big scale. We cannot, sometimes we cannot put the data within the same data center. So we run a IO rebalancer, which moves our data around. The scheduler system should be smart enough, which can understand the location of the, the data and also need to optimize now to strand the computation resources. The last reason is because of scale. So we operate on very big scale. In, in terms of our fleet size today, our, in total, our fleet size is around like hundreds of thousands of machines with different machine types from different data centers and physical locations. And they are also growing. And in terms of the job scheduling throughput, so we schedule hundreds of millions of jobs per day. Due to those three reasons, we decided to build our own schedule instead of picking an open source one. So let's take a uh, look. What is Tangram? What is really is Tangram? So from the user perspective, Tangram provides basically two kinds of APIs to our user. The first API is our main entry point. We call it declarative API. So it's like basically fire and forget API. You fire your job, and the system will take care of your job, and you forget about it. And when the job is done, you know the results. And the second API, we call it low-level API, which is used by our Spark driver. The Spark driver can talk to our resource manager directly and uh, launch executors and run the queries. So in order to serve those two APIs, let's take a look at our main components. So first of all, we have three components. One is database. So in database, we store and bookkeep all the job you submitted to our system. And there's a main service, which is our API server. When you submit your job, you talk to the AT uh, admin service through Swift. And there is a job manager. Basically, the job manager understands the relationship, the dependency between jobs. And when you submit a job and register your job to our system, the job manager can pass the dependency and uh, also supports things like recurring execution, delayed execution. And other, on the other hand, we have another two main components. One is resource manager. Within a Tangram cluster, we have a bunch of resource manager, but there is always one master. And the master takes care of the schedule and managing all the schedulable nodes. And on each schedulable node, we run an agent. And the agent basically discover the resource manager master and report what could be scheduled and what is already running to the resource manager. So let me show you guys an end-to-end -end workflow to, to, uh, to show how those things work together. First of all, we, we, I will use our machine learning example and uh, Spark query example. So first of all, uh, our machine learning workflow platform, we call it FB Learner Flow, and uh, our squ uh, circle query platform, we call it Data Swarm. They will talk to our admin service and submit a workflow, a job. And the admin service accepts the uh, job and do some like uh, check. And then the admin service writes to database. And our job manager periodically posts the database. And uh, then check if the dependency of different jobs are met. If they are met, the job manager marks the job from pending state to ready state. Then the job manager talks to our resource manager and asks resources for running the job. 
So if you submit a Spark query or a machine learning job, First of all, we will launch a single job. Basically, it will host your Spark driver or uh, the machine learning operator. And uh, if you submit a parallel job, like a distributed training, so first of all, we launch our GAN operator. And then the GAN operator will then talk to our resource manager directly by using our low-level API to ask resources and uh, start the GAN jobs. Likewise, the Spark driver and the Digraph driver are also talking to our resource manager directly to launch all the executors and the workers for them. So there is another interesting thing, which is machine learning elastic scheduler. We are working with our machine learning team to implement that because if we take a look at the GAN job, the GAN job is very rigid. In, it is rigid because the GAN size is fixed and it is not very error resilient. So we are building an elastic scheduler to take advantage of our low-level scheduling API so that we can make the distributed training more elastic and more error resilient. So in order to talk to our resource manager, we can say actually the job manager and the other uh, operators, Spark drivers, Digraph drivers, Giraffe drivers are all our resource manager's client. We provide a client library to our application so they can talk to us. So basically, I will talk about the client library. So first of all, let's see, we have an application and we have a Tangram client library. And in order to talk to our resource manager and agent, the application needs to use our client library. And the client library will, based on our service location, to discover the location of the resource manager and establish a resource session with the resource manager. Once the session is established, the resource manager returns a session ID back to the client. And the client can use the session ID to send the resource requests to the resource manager to ask resources. Once you, don't, once, you are, uh, once you don't need the resources anymore, you can release the resources back to the resource manager. And the resource manager will do scheduling on the resource manager. Once the scheduling is done, the resource manager pushes the scheduling result, which is, we call it resource grant, back to the client library through Swift. And the client library will fire a callback and let the application know. And once the application knows, knows the resource grant. The application can use the resource grant to, and talk to the client library again and uh, talk to the agent to launch the container and host your job. So the Tangram client library periodically queries different agents to decide the client, uh, the container running status. Once the container is finished, the agent will also send a push notification to the client and let the client know. This is how high level how, uh, how the application inter interacts with our resource manager directly. And uh, <clears throat> in our box of our cluster, we run an agent. And the responsibility of the agent is, first of all, the agent needs to discover what, where is the master of the resource manager, and the agent reports its presence to the resource manager and all the schedulable resources to the resource manager. Periodically, on the agent side, we run a bunch of health checks, and if the health check cannot pass, the agent sends back the health check results to the resource manager, and the resource manager will disable the agent. Then, no new jobs will be uh, dispatched to the agent. I just talk about we support constraint-based scheduling. So one of the constraints is based on the capability of the machine. So the agent, one of the responsibility of the agent is to collect the uh, machine's capability and represent them as labels and report to the resource manager. Then the resource manager can make the decision based on the user's request. And also, the agent accepts launching container and the queue container command. There is one responsibility, which is container recovery. I will cover it in the failure recovery protocol. And uh, last but not the least, 
the agent also sets up the C group V2 to help us cap the resource usage to better support multi tenants in the same host. And then let me talk a little bit about our failure recovery protocol. There are two failure scenarios in our scheduling system. The first failure scenario is agent failure. And uh, if the agent fails, actually bef before we launch a container, the agent writes the recovery information of one container to its local disk. After the container rest agent restarts, the agent scans its local disk to discover any recover direct information and try to reestablish the relationship between the running containers. And if the container has already finished, they is, uh, we will log the exit code in the local directory, a uh, local disk, and the agent can report to the application scheduler. And there is another case, which is the failure of our resource manager. Basically, our resource manager is stateless. Everything is only logged in its memory, so the source of the truth is our client. So basically, it's a responsibility of the client to resync what is in the client's memory with the resource manager. So basically, when the client or the agent discover the resource master is gone, the client will hold off all the communication to the resource manager until the new resource manager must shows up. Once the new resource manager shows up, our client will resync its session information, including like resource requests, allocated resources with the resource manager, and to help the resource manager rebuild its internal state. And at the same time, the agent will re-add itself to the resource the new master, then they can become schedulable. Okay, so this is a high level uh, idea about how Tangram works, and I will hand over to my colleague Hao, who will be talking about scheduling policy. All right, thank you, Ray. And uh, again, my name's Hao, I, my work mostly focuses on the Tangram scheduling and resource management at Facebook. Uh, so Tangram sc scheduling policies is set up in the queue structures. Our queue is structured in a hierarchical way, like a tree, or you can think of it as like, uh, similar to a, a file system. Uh, we have internal queues and the leaf queues. So in this example, you can see that at the root level, so we have uh, a one queue for each organization like as a newsfeed, and within one organization, we further have sub queues like uh, for different type of jobs. Uh, for example, we have production pipeline jobs or uh, ad hoc interactive analysis jobs. So the jobs can be only queued on the leaves. Um, in addition to the uh, parent and children structure, uh, the queues also needs, needs to be specified with uh, c uh, resource configurations. Uh, for example, like the minimum resources guaranteed for a specific queue or, or the, uh, the maximum uh, resources uh, that the resource assigned to the specific queue can never exceed. Uh, also, very importantly, uh, queues need to be specified with a scheduling policy. Uh, we support a whole bunch of lists of different policies for different applications including like FIFO, uh, Dominant Resource Fairness, DRF. For those who are not so familiar with DRF, that is the uh, scheduling algorithm also proposed by the uh, Spark creators uh, from Berkeley. Um, it, it works very similar to a decision tree. So in this example, we assign like 80% of resources to as queue and 20% to the feed queue. And uh, remember that the resource can have uh, multiple dimensions. Uh, including like CPUs, memories, uh, disk, you name it. Um, so the DRF provides a way that you can uh, compare the resource usage across different queues and help the schedule to make a decision like uh, from which queue it will pick a job to schedule. And we also support uh, user fairness. Uh, like in this example, we have uh, interactive queue uh, uses, uh, user, fairness po user fairness policy. Assuming that we have two users submitting jobs to this queue, user one and user two, uh, the policy will guarantee that each user is gonna, gonna be guaranteed with a 50% share of the resources. Uh, global policy. Um, this is also something that we use intensively in production clusters. Uh, what we do is, uh, instead, of, instead of like doing the tree, a decision tree, we actually flattened the tree structure into one single line queue, so with a global ordering of all the jobs. And a scheduler gonna follow, uh, try to schedule jobs one by one by following that order. 
Within one single queue, the jobs are ordered by their priorities uh, submission time to break the tie. And within one single queue, multiple type of jobs can be submitted into, into, the, into it. Uh, inclu uh, for, for this example, we have one single queue with five uh, different jobs. Uh, three of them are actually GAN jobs, and two of them are single jobs. So GAN jobs are treated as first-class citizen in our scheduler because uh, it requires all of its requests to be allocated before making progress. And we support look-ahead scheduling. Um, it also known as the delayed scheduling or backfill scheduling in some academic papers. Um, we use that to improve our overall job scheduling throughput and cluster utilization. Uh, for example, there might be, in this example, uh, we have a very big GAN job uh, blocking ahead of the queue, uh, which requests 200 uh, tasks. And at this point of time, we might not have all the resource available for this GAN job. And the scheduler will look ahead and try to schedule the rest of four jobs in the, waiting in the queue and pick maybe one or more of them uh, uh, to achieve better packing efficiency. The downside of doing so is that we are risking to starve some of our, our bigger jobs. So we, uh, the scheduler does have the starvation detection and prevention mechanisms. Uh, so that if this monitors like the, the, the queuing, queuing time for a specific job, and if the queuing time is reaching its SLA, the scheduler will restrict the look, ha look ahead scheduling and prevent the resources that needed from the starving job to be taken away by the other jobs. So once the scheduler has identified the job to schedule, it will try to allocate resources for it. We support very fine-grained resource specification, uh, so the jobs can request the resources in terms of uh, CPU millicores and memory bytes. Um, in this way, we can achieve better packing efficiency and reduce fragmented resources. In addition to the resource specification, uh, the job can also specify uh, the label constraints. Uh, for example, in this example, we have a job requesting uh, resources from a specific data center, data center one, and needs a machine type in either machine type one or machine type two, and it requ require the machine with uh, installed version, uh, uh, kernel version to be above 4.10. Um, also, the job can specify the job affinity or task affinity. For example, one job can request 100 tasks uh, to be run in one single data center. So once the resource manager parses this resource requirements, uh, it will run the following four steps to complete the resource allocation. Uh, first, we keep the prefetch host, host cache, uh, where we keep a list of hosts that we know that those hosts are eligible uh, to allocate a resource for, for a specific request. Uh, if fortunately we have a cache hit, it will bypass the, the step two and step three and go directly to step four to commit an allocation. And it's significantly speed up the entire allocation process. If unfortunately we don't have a cache hit, it will uh, run through step two where we do a host filtering. Uh, resource managers are gonna evaluate different type of constraints, including hard constraints and soft constraints, uh, like resources, label, uh, job affinity. Um, the output of this step is gonna be a list of candidate hosts, um, and then run through step three, where we score those hosts and pick the, the one uh, scores the highest to complete uh, the allocation. We have different uh, scoring uh, strategies, which is pluggable, uh, including like packing efficiency. We can do like best fit, worst fit, random fit, uh, and estimate the probability of whether the host is healthy enough to run a specific job, and the data locality, for example. And finally, we commit allocation uh, and update the cluster states and the queue uh, parameters. So as we have said, we manage a cluster of heterogeneous hardwares and, from, and, and machines from different locations. Uh, so we intensively use constraint-based scheduling or label-based scheduling uh, in our system. Um, our jobs have uh, a variety of, can request a, a variety of constraints, including like machine types, uh, locations, CPU architecture, GPU ar architecture, uh, host prefix, uh, kernel versions or package versions, et cetera. Um, and our resource manager are gonna manage like a, a merged uh, 
resource pool and make sure that uh, the job gets the resources match its constraints. So to guarantee the resource availab availability, SLA, for our queues, uh, the preemption support is necessary. Um, the, Tangram the Tangram preemption is kicked off periodically, and what it does is it's trying to identify the starving jobs and over-allocated jobs and try to preempt the over-allocated jobs and reclaim the resources, give it back to the starving ones. To minimize the preemption cost, we conduct a two-phase protocol. That means the preemption logic is going to run twice in each cycle. And each of uh, the runs is going to generate a candidate uh, of uh, jobs to be preempted. And only the candidates appearing in both phases will be uh, committed to final preemption. And meanwhile, the resource manager is going to send preemption notification to the client side saying that uh, I'm going to preempt you and the client is going to take whatever the necessary, necessary actions it needed, like doing the checkpointing, which is very important for long-running jobs. Um, within the Facebook scale, uh, we have uh, our table data uh, spans across different location boundaries. And we need to schedule our jobs across different data centers. And what we also, our resource manager, manage a very big cluster with uh, uh, the hosts coming from different locations. And this raised a lot of challenges in our scheduling uh, efficiency. For example, there are going to be calls the strand is capacity with uh, imbalanced workloads across different data centers. Some of the data centers can be, uh, become the hotspot for uh, computation and others uh, for storage. Um, some of the job may be run in one data center is reading or writing data in a, data, uh, in a different data center. So it leads to a poor data locality and waste of a network bandwidth. Also, in cases of like uh, disaster happen happening, uh, we need to take down some of the data centers, and uh, our scheduler needs to react very fast to drain the jobs and stop from scheduling new jobs to a specific data location. So the way we're trying to resolve this, uh, to tackle those uh, challenges, is to uh, create two different components to interact with Tangram scheduling system. We call this dispatcher proxy uh, and a planner. So the job is going to be submitted to our dispatcher first. Um, in this example, you can see that uh, each of our resource manager is going to manage the resource capacities from different data centers. And the dispatcher uh, trying to monitor the resource cons consumption across different resource manager and different data centers. So the job is going to be dispatched to uh, the proper resource manager based on the resource consumption. And at the same time, the dispatcher is going to attach the location hint to the job so that the resource manager is going to pick it up and try to respect this location hint. Uh, the location hint is actually treated as a soft constraint. At the same time, the planner also monitors the traffic across different uh, data centers and decides how to move data around to minimize cross data center traffic and improve the data locality. So in this way, we try to make sure that our job is actually making the best use of our resources and achieve the best performance it can, uh, can potentially be. And also, at the same time, helping us to improve our allocation throughput. So this pretty much concludes like very, from very high level how Tangram schedule, schedule jobs and do resource allocation. And I will hand over to Ray to talk about the road ahead of us. All right. Thank you, Hao. So uh, basically, there are some works uh, we are doing and uh, we will be doing. So first of all, all the Tangram clusters are like a dedicated cluster in terms of application type. So we don't mix different applications like machine learning or Spark or DiGraph together. If we actually we want to do that so that we can further improve our cluster composition because uh, time-wise, they have different like workload pattern. And secondly, uh, actually the uh, demand for the resources to run the batch workloads are growing like very crazily. 
but we only have enough resources. We don't, uh, we don't have enough resources. We want to actually share the resources with our online services. So we are working with our online services team so that we can build a system which can get resources with the lease with some SLA from the off-peak hours. And we can, at that time, we can run the uh, batch workloads on the boxes owned by the online uh, services. And the third is actually uh, our applications and the, uh, our users often oversubscribe the resources. So the physical utilization is always a problem. And some big users have their own system to predict the resource usage and fine tune their resource specification. We want to make it a very systematic way so that every user can benefit from this. Last but not the least, if you are interested in Tangram, and if you are interested in joining our journey of building the Facebook skill uh, scheduling system, you can send your resume to me. This is my email. So uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Ray and Hao. Uh, if you came in late, we do have about seven minutes for Q&A. Uh, if you have questions, please come to this mic over here or that mic on the far side, and we'll alternate questions between them. Thanks. Hello, uh, nice talk. Um, the question I have is, I, I, I don't think you mentioned, how do you deal with time constraints and deadlines? And then, uh, that's one. The second thing is, how do you distinguish between soft and hard constraints? Do you want to answer? Oh, sorry. Well, what's your first question? The first is, how do you deal with time constraints? For example, jobs that have to finish by a specific amount of, uh, by specific time, right? So there's a lot of research done there because if, for example, you have a job that uh, can run within the next few hours, you have a bunch of opportunities that you can miss w in the, those hours, right? So there's a bunch of uh, different scheduling policies that you can take into account there. So actually, uh, let me rephrase your question. The first, the question con consists of two parts. The first part is how do we deal with job time, time constraints? Di basically, di di the line, right? Some, some jobs should be finished before some time, exactly. right? And the second uh, part of your question is, how do we deal with hard constraint and a soft constraint? How do you so, distinguish? Yeah. Sure. So uh, I can uh, answer the question about the deadline based scheduling. So basically, there are two things we are doing. The first thing is, uh, basically, we identify all the jobs within Facebook and divide them into different tier. So for the most, most important tiers, actually, we care. We don't care when the job gets started, but we care when the job can finish. So basically, in our scheduler, we have a policy on our scheduler side to enforce uh, deadline based on the prediction of the job duration. And also, we have an offline planner, which can help us to shape when we uh, submit the job to the resource manager. So you have some kind of reservation uh, there, right? Yes. Yes. Right. Cool. And uh, for the soft constraint and hard constraint, I think how can I answer? Uh, yeah, when the job is submitted to the system, it has to specify like whether the constraint is hard or, or soft. And uh, the uh, schedule or resource manager is going to treat it differently. So for hard constraints, whether uh, if uh, the constraint cannot be met, then uh, it's going to be queued in, in the queue for sure. And for soft constraints, uh, it's going to wait for a while to see like uh, to like reevaluate like the soft constraints. If it, it cannot uh, like met constraints, it will like get whatever the, the resources. So they're, they're user defined pretty much? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, I have a question on this side. Hi, yeah, so um. I came a little late, so I might miss, uh, miss some background, but uh, my understanding is that, uh, so you have uh, like uh, improved, uh, you improved some like a job, a job scheduler, mm -hmm. and uh, your Spark is run on top of uh, Yarn, is that right? No, Spark is not running on top of Yarn. Spark is using our resource manager directly. Oh, directly. So, yes. so basically, you are improving the Spark job scheduling part. Uh, so basically, for each Spark query, we launch a Spark driver. So we actually override the backend cluster scheduler, which talks to our resource manager directly to allocate resources. 
So underlying, so uh, Spark drop, uh, you're, you're basically managing the resource uh, on the, by the by the schedule yes, itself. Yes, so there is no yarn. So we manage all the resources by ourselves. I so have you con considered have you considered to use yarn for the resource manager? Uh, uh, yes, we uh, initially we considered, but due to uh, the reason I already talked. Actually, there are there are three reasons. The first reason is uh, we need to support various workloads, and they are very different. Uh, and the second reason is we have very high demands of customizing our scheduling policy. And the third reason is our throughput uh, requirement and the scale is very big. So due to that three reasons, we decided to build our own scheduler. Uh, but for uh, my, from my understanding, so for young, so you can specify for each uh, young queue, you specify a different uh, job scheduling policy, right? So that probably, and uh, for uh, basically the scalability, so I think right now we have the young federation, so you can basically uh, use the federation to manage multiple young cluster, so that can also improve the scalability. I think, yes, you are right. But uh, we, we started this project several years ago. At that time, young is not uh, much, that mature. And uh, in terms of customizing our scheduling policy, we also needed to integrate with a lot of our C C Facebook internal service, like uh, how just mentioned, the IO rebalancer, which is not very easy for us to move fast. And uh, in terms of like the scheduling throughput of one cluster, actually, right now, our cluster size is very big. And we can still uh, maintain very high throughput without federation. Okay, and another thing is that, uh, so you said that for different type of wo workloads, you are put into different, uh, like uh, use different uh, job scheduling policy for them. So uh, so how do you, uh, so from the previous uh, uh, questions answer, so it seemed to me like uh, you are doing some like prediction at the runtime, is that, um, but is that how you like uh, do the characterization of the workload at the uh, runtime? No, so uh, basically I'm mentioning here, so all our cluster is dedicated cluster. So we don't mix application in one cluster. So uh, right now we deploy our machine learning uh, application in one cluster, Spark in another cluster. And uh, uh, what is the question as asked by uh, uh, that gentleman was, uh, how do we deal with different type of workload? So uh, we actually divide our workloads into different tiers. For very important workloads, we based on historical data and also some like duration prediction so that we can give very uh, predictable uh, performance of the landing time to those jobs. Okay, but if I'm a, I, I'm a customer, I have a, like a submitted a job, maybe the job, so how, how do you like see if it's uh, uh, very important or it's like uh, you, which policy you should use? Uh, so basically, on top of our resource manager, we uh, actually we define mechanism, <laughs> and uh, uh, we have different like resource pool owner and uh, also application layer. They can define the, like the policy. And for instance, we don't know the uh, priority of each job, but our uh, App layer, application, uh, app layer application knows, okay, if it is like a mission critical job, if it is like a uh, revenue uh, generation job. So if those are jobs, we actually we provide toolings they can uh, tag with different priority and also give us, us hints like uh, duration. So when they submit the job, they actually provide some like a tag or something? Uh, we, yes, we have a system to uh, uh, gather the tag uh, from our database and uh, based on different uh, data source and uh, tag and uh, give to us. Okay, yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, thank you. Thank By you. Way, so the Tangram is uh, op uh, open sourced? So other Tangram is not open source. Uh, so basically, we cannot, <laughs> other, other company cannot use it. Uh, yes, right now, actually, actually, we have a plan to open source Tangram, but uh, uh, probably not in the near future, in, in the near, near future. And if you are interested, you can uh, talk to me uh, in person offline. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Question, do you have uh, overall CPU utilization numbers for your whole fleet? I mean, how effective is your scheduler at using up the CPU cycles? How do you want to answer this question? Uh, you mean a CPU utilization on uh, for the entire cluster or for the resource manager? Uh, for all data centers under this scheduler. Uh, the currently, it's, it's varies a lot across different like uh, use cases. For example, for Spark, the utilization is really high. It's around like uh, 80% to 90%, even above. 
And for machine learning workloads, um, is fairly lower, like around uh, below 50%. And one other question for, um, you said you only use measurement-based prediction of runtimes. Jobs do not declare their own runtimes or estimates of their runtimes? Uh, yes, we do have a pipelines to estimate the critical like pipelines. So that's like the learning model or something to, to get the estimates. It's not declared if... Actually, there are two ways to uh, estimate the duration. One way is basically a lot of like data warehouse workloads are like recurring workloads. Yes. They deal with like the same data size, so mm -hmm. we do that historical data. And for machine learning workload, we have um, like a machine learning pipeline which can help us predict the duration of the training job. And so for a, one last thing, for periodic um, jobs with deadlines, do you um, do any schedulability analysis to prove whether they can meet their deadlines or? Yes, so have we have an offline planner which is an offline component, which just uh, gathers all the important jobs and uh, the predicted duration and uh, try to do a big packing and uh, predict if we can fit the deadline. Uh, I have one simple question. So at the beginning of when you designed the Tangra, have you ever looked into Mesos? Because uh, some of the construct you have is very similar to the two, two level scheduler that Mesos offer. Yes, we looked at Mesos. Uh, initially, and uh, but we think uh, we have very high demand in terms of latency, and uh, this is one reason. And the other reason is at that time we need to integrate with a lot of Facebook internal like monitoring system, uh, file, sy uh, file system. So then uh, we didn't go to that direction. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hi. I have one question. Um, can you elaborate on how to like fetch? dependencies or even environments for each job? Like, do you have like a container registry to pull images from, or do you like bootstrap the cluster? Oh, like, yeah. this is a very good question. Actually, uh, so uh, we don't manage our machines on bare metal. We live in our Facebook's uh, self-built container system. So there's a paper published by Facebook called uh, Topware. And so basically, uh, all the container manager and the resource manager is launched as a long-running service by Topware. And somehow, uh, we have a Topware container. So uh, we use our Facebook internal stuff. We call it like a, a chef Topware sh uh, image and chef solo to uh, push the dependent, uh, to uh, provision the dependency. And when we accept a, con a Tangram container request, we create a container within the Topware container so uh, that we can uh, have the dependency ready. So the image is like, is like tagged with some name, like a label, so each job has that label to recognize which image in that registry and stuff like that, right? Uh, this is a very good question. Actually, uh, just I mentioned uh, on the first line, right now we ha uh, our cluster is like a dedicated cluster, so in each cluster we just run a certain uh, a certain type of application, so they yeah. share the same dependency, so we don't need to do that at the wrong time. But in the long run, we are going to do like very deep integration with our uh, container team so that uh, the job can tell us what is the image they want to use, and we can also leverage like image uh, cache to make that dependency provisioning uh, faster if we uh, mix uh, application in one cluster. Understood, thank you. Thank you. Um, hi. Um, Quick question. Um, Over there. Uh, yeah, I'm just saying. Hi, sorry. Yeah, I'm um, uh, not sure, but um, uh, like uh, Presto um, is there for doing analytics and it has its own scheduling uh, way and it exists. Uh, and if I come to the Spark world, um, that's where it, the deficiency is still there. You can't use Spark directly to for multiple users. Um, uh, like. Uh, so is there any comparison with somebody is using something like Presto with HDFS and it gives data locality um, and resource scheduling as well as multiple users can use it compared to um, Tangram and how, how it fits uh, that scenario? How do you if want you, to answer this question? Uh, I think at Facebook, this, uh, the Presto use cases and, and the Spark use cases are targeting different uh, kind of applications. So here we are targeting, say, the Spark use cases. Uh, yeah, for Tangram, it's targeting Spark use cases, which uh, includes uh, like uh, the periodic pipelines and uh, Presto is okay. more, more fo focused on like short 
running in interactive. Re interactive analysis. Okay, so here we are not trying to solve that problem. Yes, here actually, uh, actually we have a plan to integrate Tangram resource manager <laughs> with uh, the scheduling system used by Presto so that we can share the resources better between those two systems. Good. But right now, in terms of data warehouse workloads, we are focusing on Spark, which is one uh, major, uh, major batch workloads, and the other one is uh, Giraffe. So basically, uh, it's our uh, iterative pro uh, graph uh, processing right. system. Okay, and uh, when, I, when we say Spark, if like, uh, how do you handle, uh, do you also share the session of the Spark, like somebody has started a, a, a driver which starts a session and then it's running its query, and then another user comes, like so how it deals with those scenarios? Oh, I think that is uh, uh, take, taken care of uh, by the Spark driver. So the abstraction provided by Tangram is a session concept. So basically, uh, when Spark driver starts, it establishes a resource session right. with the resource manager, then it gets a token. We call it a session ID. If you get the session ID, uh, our, you need to keep alive with the session, and uh, you can use the session ID to ask resources. Uh, right now, actually, this, each Spark query actually will be translated to uh, an individual Tangram session, so they don't share session together. Got it. So it will be more like a dynamic, like I submit a query, it will use, say, 20 executors, done it, and those 20 executors, again, will be available for other people to use. Yes. So basically, okay. the Spark driver will think, okay, I own the cluster by myself but the resource manager will uh, help to create the multi-tenancy environment for different uh, users. Got it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, um, few questions. The first is, what is the scale of the resource manager? Like, you have to uh, schedule millions, hundreds of millions of jobs per day. What is the scale of the resource manager? Uh, you mean the cluster size for a single yeah. resource yeah. manager? Yeah. It's uh, tens of thousands. Tens of thousands. thousands hosts. Yes. Um, for the scaling, for the scaling queue, is that queue distributed among these uh, resource managers, resource manager nodes? Um, depending on like the application, it's uh, the, the queue is specific for one uh, specific uh, cluster. Uh, for one resource uh, resource manager. Yeah, but um, a single resource manager has you, you mentioned has hundreds thousands of machines, right? Yes. And uh, the queue is shared among these machines. Uh, yeah. Is a I, I think. I, I so think the queue like basically is an abstraction layer. So uh, you submit to the virtual queue, and uh, uh, by after you submit your job to the virtual queue, our resource manager decide based on the queue policy which job to run. And uh, then we will come to the next stage and do bin packing and decide which machine to run your job. Yeah, um, so somehow you can say the queue is shared uh, logically by all uh, by the machines. So um, is yeah, there the a problem of the consistency of the queue, or is it not a problem? Like each machine of the resource manager see the same queue all the time, or it doesn't matter. Machine doesn't need to know the existence of the queue, so the queue just uh, lives on the resource manager side. So uh, uh, we only I'm have one about. master uh, within one cluster, so there's no consistency issue. Yes. The master is a super computer, or it's also another cluster? The resource. The resource master is just a one single node. There's no difference, uh, no specific difference between uh, among the other like worker nodes. It's not a supercomputer, but uh, yeah, uh, it has a better computation capability and a bigger memory yeah. compared with other work nodes. And a queue is just more like concept on a, for the jobs instead of like the concept of resources. Yes. Yeah, so the queue only exists in the resource manager master. Yes. Yes. Okay. Then that makes the resource manager a single point of failure. So does it fail? On what kind of situation where it fails? Any examples of that? Uh, we, we do have uh, multiple like uh, resource manager instances. Uh, one is the master, the other are secondary. So once the master fails, it's going to fail over to the secondary. And we're going to preserve, 
we don't, uh, the, the resource manager itself is uh, stateless, but we're gonna collect like the, the, the job information from the client side, so that's rebuild uh, the cluster states, which is exactly the same as the, uh, the old master. Interesting, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you.